welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. And welcome back to Note Doctors. On this episode, our very special guest is Gary Karpinski. So Ben, tell us a little bit about Dr. Karpinski. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Gary S. Karpinski is professor of music at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has served on the faculties of the University of Oregon, Brooklyn College, and Temple University. His monograph, Aural Skills Acquisition, is published by Oxford University Press. His textbooks, Manual for Ear Training and Sight Singing, and Anthology for Sight Singing, are published by W.W. Norton. His research interests include music theory, pedagogy, music perception, and cognition, early 20th century music, and Schenkerian analysis. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we as musicians are at uh, the mercy of our short-term memory unless we learn to use it to focus on things. And to me, this is a, such an important aspect of, of dictation training is that it can help students discipline their focused attention and their musical memory, which we use all the time, right? Students sitting in a class and the teacher says, hey, what motive are the bassoons playing at the beginning of the development? You know, recording. Um, a student is teaching a lesson and they hear a student play from rehearsal G to rehearsal H. You know, how, what are they focusing on? Can they focus their attention and keep a certain thing in their head to be able to process it? And to realize that you can't remember all of rehearsal G to re rehearsal H. Uh, even that in and of itself, I think is an important thing for, for musicians to learn. So today's special guest for this episode is Gary Karpinski. We are so pleased, Gary, to have you on as our guest. And we like to always ask um, the people that we have on just a little bit of their background, um, how they got into music theory, why did you choose uh, to study it, and especially for you, what compelled you to choose kind of the most universally loathed theory topic, of course, oral skills, <laughs> as kind of your life's work. And so <laughs> how did that happen? Well, first of all, thank you very much for me, inviting me to be here. I'm really happy to be here, and, and, and I'm glad to be chatting with all of you about this. Uh, you know, as far as my background is concerned, I, I was born and raised in uh, suburban Philadelphia. Uh, I ended up going to Peabody Conservatory and uh, Temple University. And uh, I, I finished my undergraduate degree in three and a half years, and there were reasons for that. And, and I uh, kind of fell into the master's program at Temple. And um, a position opened up uh, for an assistantship in teaching oral skills. And up to that point, you know, my experiences had been, you know, kind of uh, varied. But uh, um, as a French horn player, of course, you're playing in the upper part of the overtone series. And so if your ear's not working for you, there's really <laughs> going to be a lot of mistakes. And, and I figured things out just by fumbling around with them. But um, when I started teaching it, uh, at Temple U, that was when uh, I really started to ask some serious questions about, you know, how this this pedagogy of this stuff worked. And uh, I was very lucky after one year of doing that assistantship um, that a position opened up in May. And um, at that point, there was actually a faculty position. I was 23 years old and uh, I, I, I ended up teaching oral skills full time. Uh, so I spent three years doing that and, and working with lots of students individually and looking at the kinds of things that uh, had been handed down to me uh, through my teachers and saying, well, a lot of this stuff is not working. Um, and, and instrumental teachers saying, you know, we've got these really great performers. Why are they not doing well in oral skills classes? And um, so I started to do some research into the science behind all this. So looking at, at, at aspects of things like uh, uh, short-term memory, for example, and uh, tonic perception and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and this was, this was in the early 1980s. Uh, but that's what really got me interested in it. And uh, even after I went you know, and did my doctorate and did work in early 20th century music and Shankarian analysis, I was always still fascinated by the questions uh, that were out there that other people didn't seem to be asking and I wanted to try to answer. Uh, and so that's when I started to do some you know, really serious research into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you feel like you were kind of just going into uncharted territory? I mean, what was out there 
at the time, as far as, you know, oral skills, oral perception, really, was there really anything out there that you could grab onto? In the early 1980s, uh, there was nothing in um, music theory. Um, you know, if you go back wow. and you look, at, if you look at the Journal of Music Theory, uh, which was founded in what, 1959, uh, there was an initial uh, editorial that said we're going to call for articles in four areas, uh, history of theory, uh, theoretical systems, so on, and, and the fourth one was pedagogy. Uh, and then after about 25 years of that, uh, they did a survey and they found that there really weren't any pedagogy articles that had been submitted. So, mm-hmm. so right, the journal of music theory wasn't founded until the, the mid 80s. Uh, so I went looking uh, further afield into some, some cognition literature, but also uh, into music education. Uh, and there were people who were doing research on this in, in music ed field. So the Journal of Research in Music Education, for example, was, was a good resource at, at that point. It's amazing the amount of crossover we've had just on the podcast, just the you know, 10 episodes we've had. A lot of people have started uh, from music ed, whether it was actually mm-hmm. their degree or just an area of interest for them. The crossover is just really remarkable. Yeah, and, and, and they really had a head start on, on us. I mean, JMTP, uh, you know, took a while to get off the ground. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what was that started, 86 or something like that? Uh, and, you know, if you're only getting one or two issues of that a year and that's the only place for pedagogical writing, things are going to be uh, pretty slow. Um, I was very lucky that uh, um, Mike Rogers uh, invited me. He was the founding editor of, of JMTP. Uh, and when I was a brand new green assistant professor out at University of Oregon, uh, through Bob Hurwitz, who was on the faculty out there, uh, contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in writing some articles about oral skills acquisition and and so I I wrote some review articles and then uh, uh, an article on on, uh, perception and its uh, relation to um, uh, dictation in particular and uh, that sort of you know, really paved the way for me that that became a kind of model for me in my career I mean you know I was a young scholar and didn't necessarily know what I was doing uh, so I had to look at a lot of other articles to see how people were handling this kind of stuff and even in a, a, other fields like language acquisition for example how people were approaching this stuff uh, and and that you know opened doors for me at that point uh, you know it's always nice in your career when when you start to do things and uh, uh, things take off, you know, people contact you. And, and the next thing that happened was that Mary Beth Payne uh, contacted me. She was working at Shermer Books at the time uh, and uh, wanted me to do some kind of textbook or something. I said, well, I'm not ready to do that yet. I want to do research uh, and I want to you know, lay the groundwork for this so I know what I'm doing before I, I write a textbook. Uh, and she said, well, that's not really what I'm doing at Shermer. Uh, and sure enough, within a few years, she got a job at Oxford University Press, and she contacted me again and said, well, I really think you should do something on oral skills acquisition. And that actually became the title of the book. It's a great text. I know we all use it and refer to it. It's, it's really a different kind of research uh, than what we're trained to do as music theorists in graduate school. You know, we do a lot of analysis, maybe some history of theory. So you kind of touched on this just now, but what were the areas where you really had to kind of stretch yourself and go a different direction in order to do the type of writing that you did for RL skills acquisition? Well, of course, you know, I, I, I'm trained uh, as a music theorist. And so music analysis okay. and sort of the stuff that bleeds over into musicology. So, you know, if you're doing some work on late Beethoven, for example, you know how to read the Beethoven biographies and stuff in journals like Music Theory Spectrum and whatnot, but mm-hmm. to uh, be able to read even just a music ed article um, that's you know, uh, research-based, um, mm-hmm. you know, either, either clinical studies or, or anecdotal stories even, uh, it's a different kind of field. Uh, and so that took a little bit of stretching, but then the bigger stretching was actually to be able to get into the cognition stuff. And mm-hmm. one of the things that spurred me to, to look at, looking at cognition, this is a, a, an interesting little side story. So I'm teaching at Temple U, uh, and uh, Edwin Gordon uh, was on mm-hmm. the faculty, the music ed faculty there. 
And he was at loggerheads with the music theorists that had been there long before I even got there. And so I find myself, That sounds you know, unlikely. I can never <laughs> imagine <laughs> theorists not getting along. And, and, and so I thought, well, there are two ways we can handle this. And one is to just ignore him or to try to meet him on his own terms, which is doing the research. Uh, and so that's actually when I started reading things, particularly about uh, uh, tonal perception, um, you know, a lot of those little uh, Gordon pitch patterns were not really contextually oriented from from real music, but were sort of invented out of thin air. And so, so well, let's see what how people perceive tonality, what kinds of aspects of, of pitch and rhythm uh, imply keys to people and how do we infer what the tonic is from that, 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 uh, that kind of context. Um, and uh, you know, there were some other things, short term musical memory, as I mentioned before, that played a really important role at that point. Um, and so at that point, then I was trying to read uh, these scientific articles, and I realized that it's actually not that hard if, if you've got half a brain, um, because they make it so easy for you. First of all, there's always an abstract, which we didn't start doing in the humanities until you know, recently. Um, you can read the introduction, which in, usually in plain language lays out what the issue is. <clears throat> you can then skip ahead to the uh, conclusion and then work your way back into the article, looking at the discussion, and then if some of the statistics are too hard for you, you can either get a friend to help you out, uh, or you can say, well, I've gotten enough out of this article, let's compare it with six other things, and, and so on. So I, it was actually quite fun to see there was all this stuff out uh, in, in the cognition literature that would have direct bearing on what we were doing in, in oral skills training. Um, and then beyond that, there are things that just simply haven't been uh, tackled. Uh, for instance, the idea of real-time processing. Uh, of, of sound. It's one thing to talk about yeah. someone, say, taking dictation, hearing something, remembering it, sitting there with a pencil, you know, and working stuff out. But what's really happening? What's our goal? One of our goals is for listeners to be able to do this in real time as they're listen, listening mm -hmm. to music. We all know, you know, we do that. And, and there are times where it lets us down. And there are other times where we're really in that kind of game theory flow where it's working mm -hmm. for us. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. And, and um, so uh, I said, well, there's nothing about music uh, listening at all about, uh, in, in relation to that. And so what I did was I looked into language acquisition. Um, one of the things, my, my wife uh, is a, um, uh, a translator. Hmm. And um, so she had been studying in school uh, uh, simultaneous translation. And one of the things that they do is uh, to train people to listen to something in one language and then speak it in another language. And in order to start that process, they'll have people listen in their language and then repeat it in the same language. Right. So all you're doing is just listening to it. So she was listening to the radio and saying back what people were saying on, on the radio. Uh, at the same time. Uh, and, and I thought, well, that's very much like what we're doing when we're listening to music and mm -hmm. processing at the same time. So I started to look at, you know, what, what have we learned from language acquisition? Uh, so sometimes we have to look at things like visual perception or language processing or whatever, because there's just simply nothing that's going on right now in, in uh, theory pedagogy that will help us out. You know, that's it had to be so exciting for you. Daunting for one thing, because you had nothing. But as a, as a young a professor, young scholar, like to find this huge field that's just waiting, you know, to be explored. It had to be really exciting because you kind of were on, were on that cutting edge. When I think about just kind of cognition and how you would research those things, you know, recordings and being able to analyze things with the technology that we have today is so far advanced, I would think, from in the 80s and 90s when you were first starting that, like, how has that kind of played a role in our ability to not just test, but also to kind of uh, do research in that area? Um, yes. And, and of course, I don't do um, scientific experiments. Uh, uh, but what I do is I leech on to people who do. Uh, and, and so that's been really, really wonderful for me. And then to see, you know, the, the advantages of, of, of labs being established at places like Ohio State University, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. um, and, and the stuff that they're doing at Northwestern now, or even what uh, my colleague Chris White is doing here at UMass. He does an awful lot of low stakes, low tech uh, experimentation. Um, so he'll set up in our concert hall lobby. Uh, which is sort of a mixing place for students coming in and out of the building uh, and offer them a donut 
to uh, participate in a, an experiment for five minutes. Uh, and so there's an awful lot of that going on right mm-hmm. now and an awful lot of uh, information that we're getting. Look, I'll, I'll just give you one example. I mentioned tonic inference before. Um, and uh, I've, I've got an article that's coming out in MTO uh, next spring or summer um, uh, about the, the, the way that um, uh, solmization systems can model uh, tonic perception. And I had done research on this for the book Oral Skills Acquisition and for a paper I gave on this topic 20 years ago. And so in order to do this thing for MTO, I thought, well, I, you know, I've, I've got to do some new research. The amount of research that has been done on tonic inference and computer modeling of, t- of tonal perception just in the last two decades is, is absolutely unbelievable. And so we're all very, very fortunate to be living in a time where, you know, rather than us just saying, well, this is how people have always done it, or we think that it works this way, kind of reminds me of the way medicine was in the 19th century. Um, you know, if you were a philosopher, you could become a doctor. Uh, because you could sit and think and it's like, oh, this patient, this patient has this and so we ought to give them more liquids you know, whatever. and there's no science behind it what, whatsoever but stuff that just seemed to make sense. Um, my, my father was a research physician and he cut his teeth in the middle of the 20th century and so things had been, you know, his old teachers had come out of that old philosophical approach and, and instead had turned into scientists and I think that's what, I'll, you know, we'd, all music theorists don't have to do this. Uh, and there are some cognition people that will tell you we're going to change music theory forever. Well, yes and no. Um, but aren't those contributions great? And isn't it nice that we can yeah. know things um, like, like that? I'll just give you one one more example like that. Um, you know, we, we all always talk about organicism and tonality and how when a piece, uh, say in sonata form, returns to the tonic again after uh, the, the development section, isn't that you know, a dramatic moment? And then you look at some of the research that, that, that people like uh, Nick Cook have done on this, uh, showing that really, if you, unless you have absolute pitch, once it gets past a minute, we, we can't tell whether something ends in the, the same key or not. <laughs> I, I had a, a, a cognition seminar that I taught with, with about, um, oh, I don't know, I think there were eight students in the class. And uh, I took a, a Mozart symphony, like, I don't know, let's say number 15. I really can't remember what it was at the moment. Uh, and I took the uh, uh, exposition and uh, the recap. And so in the exposition, of course, it ends in the dominant. And then the recap, it ends in the tonic. But it was essentially the same. And the only thing that I did was I tweaked the end of the uh, exposition, the recording a little bit to make it sound like the orchestra was right. There was just a little bit of, of uh, an agogic accent at the end. Mm. Uh, and, and so then I would play one for one group and one for the other group. And I, I just asked them, you know, which one do you think is more uh, satisfying? Which way? And, and none of them, none of them had AP. Uh, and they, they, they had no preference for one over the other. So, you know, what does that tell us? Uh, a lot of this stuff is sort of Augenmusik. Uh, right, it's just eye music, yeah. and, and 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 so maybe cognition will in, will inform us along the way, uh, not only as we say do analysis, but also as we even think about constructing, uh, you know, composing pieces. Mm-hmm. So after you started doing all this reading and writing, what are the things that immediately changed in your classroom? What are the things you took back and said, oh, this has to go differently from here forward based on what I now know? That's an excellent question, um, and I'll tell you a little story, uh, and this is back from the early 80s again. So I'm teaching at Temple U, uh, and uh, I, I was starting to do some research on, on um, interval training, which a lot of schools d- did back then. You, know, you could buy entire textbooks just full of intervals. And, and um, it turned out that in the, the um, literature in music ed, there were like a dozen studies that had been done, none of which showed much correlation between people who could get good at identifying intervals out of a tonal context and what they could do in a tonal context. And vice versa. There were people who were really good at one and not at the other, and people who were really, you know, and it didn't matter. There didn't seem to be much carryover, maybe a little bit. And so I'm telling one of my classes about this, and one of the students raised her hand. She says, well, why don't you put your money where your, your mouth is? <laughs> and, and I said, you know, that's, I'll have to think about that. That's a really good point. And, and I got this. I was cleaning out my office recently, and, and, and I found this. She made this for me now. It's the radio, <laughs> so you can't see it. Um, but it is uh, two notes on a staff with a red circle and a slash through it. Uh, <laughs> basically, no intervals, right? right? And she pinned it. She pinned it to my lapel the next class meeting. <laughs> and... and 
And I, I thought, close you know, to the heart, I'm assuming. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and, and, and I thought, you know, let, let's see what happens if we just eliminate all of this bare naked interval training and do everything in tonal context. Everything's about scale degree function. Everything's about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, solmization. Right. Uh, and I, I actually think, our, well, I know that our time was much more efficiently used. Uh, right. We were no longer assessing and evaluating students on any kind of like confusion matrix. Oh, you're confusing tritones with minor six and so on. That's all data yeah. that doesn't really tell us much of anything about how people hear music in a tonal context. So that was a big change. Uh, and wow. for a number of years, I just completely eliminated interval training and only snuck it back in at certain points in the curriculum. So early on when students are, are, are learning to establish a, a tonal context around a single pitch they have to be able to sing whole or a half step above or below a given note right? so that's one interval skill that I use very early on uh, and then uh, when we get into modulations or even into secondary dominance say other chromatic harmonies they have to be able to produce certain uh, major third minor third perfect fourth things but you know the idea of being able to identify you know, a dozen or more intervals uh, from, say, you know, the Jaws theme to Maria and uh, all of that. There's just not a lot of utility for that. And the research has shown us that, that it's it's not useful in a tonal context. A um, cu- couple of other things uh, from that research early on, I would say the, the effects of uh, memory on listening skills. No one was writing or saying anything about um, how memory works when a student is trying to take dictation or transcription. And uh, so I, I, I looked into a lot of that, and that changed how I approached teaching people dictation. So, for example, at the beginning of the curriculum, then we would do short things uh, on the order of six to ten uh, notes in length, because that's what typical short-term memory is for, for musical passages. Uh, and that becomes a diagnostic tool in and of itself uh, to see which students are having difficulty with that and which ones aren't, what kind of difficulties they're having, and so on. And then there's a big leap that you make to phrase length dictations because it's not possible for a listener to hear uh, phrase length dictation say you know 17 notes in length and be able to remember all of it in one listening so what do they do uh, just try to start from the beginning and add things on to that there was a great study by Sloboda and Parker uh, where they asked uh, subjects to simply sing back uh, a melody uh, and as I recall in that study the melodies were 20 to 30 notes in length and uh, they play a melody and then say, sing back what you remember. And then they play it again. And they'd say, sing back what you remember. And they would do this, I, I believe it was six times uh, in a row. And what Sloboda and Parker concluded was that uh, subjects' answers got longer, but they didn't get any better. It was as if the subjects felt obligated to try to get more on a second and a third listening, but then things started to get polluted and the beginning would get messed up and then they get more stuff at the end. And then as the study went on, they went on to melody two and melody three, parts of melody one were coming back in melody four and, and things like that, right? Um, so yeah. what does this tell yeah. us? It tells us that we have musicians are at uh, the mercy of our short-term memory unless we learn to use it to focus on things. Things. And to me, this is a, such an important aspect of, of dictation training is that it can help students discipline their focused attention and their musical mm-hmm. memory, which we use all the time, right? Students sitting in a class and the teacher says, hey, what motive are the bassoons playing at the beginning of the development you know, recording? Um, a student is teaching a lesson and they hear a student play from rehearsal G to rehearsal H, you know, how, what are they focusing on? Can they focus their attention and keep a certain thing in their head to be able to process it? And to realize that you can't remember all of rehearsal G to re- rehearsal H. Uh, even that in and of itself, I think, is an important thing for, for musicians to learn. Um, so, the, yeah, the effects of, of memory, that, that was an important uh, change in the, in the way uh, that I taught. Um, and then um, another thing I, I think would just simply be the, the uh, emphasis on practical applications of this stuff. So to eliminate a lot of the atomistic drills and things that don't really seem to have much effect on um, what students uh, do in the real world, uh, what any listener does in the real world. Um, the, the job that I inherited at Temple U, the guy before me used to do this fun little game called Try Troubles, and he would play three notes on the piano, and he'd say, okay, this is B-flat two, what are the other two notes that I'm playing? Uh, and it is a fun game, um, but as far as practical you know, application, I'm not sure that that does, does much, much good for people. I mean, like, look, like all calisthenics, right, you can gain some benefit from those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But to me, uh, it really made me stop and think. It's like, okay, what can we do 
in musical contexts with real music, uh, or at least things like real music, um, that will help students develop practical skills. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great party trick, I suppose, but I'm not sure <laughs> anywhere else where that would be appropriate. Yeah, I'm not my, even my, sure. My... I feel like that's a fun game. Right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'd be like, oh, I don't... <laughs> I'm not sure that my, feels my fun. Brother, my brother had a friend. Uh, he was much older. He is much older than me. Uh, but I, I was in elementary school, and he was in high school, and he had some friends over. And one of his friends uh, had absolute pitch. And they could play a cluster on the piano, mm. you know, like nine notes, and leave out one note. And he'd say, oh, you're not playing F sharp. Uh, you know, just that kind of remarkable listening skill. And, and I, I don't think that that's something for us to try to develop in our students. <laughs> No, absolutely not. And it makes me think of that Rick Beato YouTube video. This this guy, YouTuber with his son, and he's, I'm not sure if you've seen this video, but he's playing these you know supernumerary chords and all these things, and this kid's basically singing and identifying all these pitches. And it's a great trick, and it's mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. skill, but not not what we want in all of our students or what we expect mm -hmm. at all, certainly. I'll confess, Gary, selfishly, I'm kind of interested about the workshops that you have um, up at UMass because I supervise a lot of teachers of oral skills um, and I've tried to put together some of my own, I'm not going to call it a workshop, but maybe just a mini uh, day long kind of uh, exploration <laughs> of some pedagogy and oral skills. And I'm just really interested in, you know, how this came about and what, what you've kind of uh, done uh, with the workshops over the years. Well, I've always loved the idea of, of workshops in general. Uh, the notion of entire days devoted to a single topic, is, I just think it's wonderful. Uh, the first time I ever had an experience like this was um, Tim Kolasik uh, ran workshops in computer-assisted instruction. Um, this was, uh, I don't know, 35 years ago or something like that. And uh, he held them down at North Texas State, um, and, and, which is now uni cool. University of North Texas. Uh -huh. And um, so uh, he offered, um, it, it was scholarships to uh, graduate students. And I was a doctoral student at the time. And so I uh, applied and got a scholarship and I got to go down to, to this uh, uh, workshop where you know we were spending, like, I forget whether it was one week or two weeks, but it was all about learning to program old 8-bit computers. Uh, so it was Apple IIs and Commodore 64s, right? Um, in another life, uh, I was an assembly language programmer on the Commodore 64. Uh, and, and so I, I learned to create uh, music symbols on the screen and manipulate them so we could do things like little, you know, interval tutors and, and things like that. Whatever was, was practically applicable on the machine, we were thinking about that rather than the pedagogy, right? But the workshops, workshops were fantastic because it was a group of, I don't know, let's say 20 people from around the country who were interested in this one topic um, and, and we just had a blast. And so um, after that, then and I remember the College Music Society started their institutes. Uh, and they had institutes for music theory pedagogy study in the late 80s and early 90s. And I attended a couple of those. Um, I remember there was one that the folks from Indiana, so back then it was Mary Wennerstrom and Gary Whitlick uh, and, and a few others. A really wonderful experience. You, know, you get 80 people in a room from around the world um, and coming to you know hear talks and to participate in things all about the teaching of music theory. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. Uh, and then Mike Rogers invited me and John Bu Carey, uh, who was at Northwestern at the time, um, to co-direct uh, a, a set of workshops uh, for CMS. And so we did a, a College Music Society workshop, which uh, I just thoroughly enjoyed. It was just absolutely fantastic to be on the other side of the coin, to be you know, directing the thing, um, but still participating in it. And so over the years, when that all that stuff fizzled out and CMS wasn't doing that anymore, I thought, well, we, we really ought to start something like this up. So it was really just very natural for me to do it. Uh, and SMT awarded me a nice startup grant uh, for which I'll forever be grateful uh, to get these going. They gave us uh, seed money in order to do it. And it's a big logistical nightmare. Um, it just, I mean, you know, just all of the little details, getting the advertising, getting the faculty together, um, arranging for catering, making sure that, uh, and, and UMass conference services, I must say, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst conference services have been fantastic and very helpful uh, for this. So they'll set up things for, you know, uh, registration page and collecting money and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
But, um, you know, those workshops attract music uh, theory teachers from around the country and really around the world. We've had people from South Africa and Scandinavia. Uh, and, uh, you know, they get to work closely with eminent uh, theory pedagogues, uh, textbook authors, researchers, model teachers uh, for a whole week. Uh, and we meet en masse, uh, but we also meet in small breakout sessions. And there are also lots of opportunities for people to get to know one another in, in informal settings as well. Uh, so it's been terrific. We do it every three years, partly because I, I would die if I had to arrange something like that every year. Um, and we've been, been doing it since 2007. Uh, and it's been really one of, one of the great pleasures in my life. I think the last one was in 2019. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, so 2022 would be your next. Uh, that'll be the, that'll be the next one. All depends upon what happens with COVID and with yeah. my career. And, you know, if I decide to retire yeah. tomorrow, I'm gonna have to think real hard about whether I want to do that. So. <laughs> so one of my favorite um, uh, activities I like to do in my theory pedagogy class the first week is have my students read your paper from 2000, the lessons from the past, music theory, pedagogy in the future. And then of course, and then Fort's response to your paper. And then, then follow that up with um, uh, Elizabeth West Marvin's article from 2011, the core curricula, music theory developments and pedagogical trends. And, and then kind of talk about, okay, what was happening in 2000, 2011, now it's 2021, right? If you're going to be writing a paper or presenting on this type of topic where you're uh, talking about what's what's going on and where the future is, is it going to how different is it going to look from like your 2000 article? Um, what what things are going to stay the same? What things changed? That's a very good question. Um, I, just thinking off the top of my head, I'd say that I would probably have to be less of an advocate for counterpoint. Uh, than I was in, in that essay. I, I think the mm -hmm. counterpoint training, uh, you know, despite how old fashioned we think of it, it's just such a fundamental thing for understanding of how Western music works dynamically uh, over time, uh, that it's great to get students involved in it. And you can go all the way back to uh, 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 John Rothkeb's article on uh, Schen Schenker and the undergraduate curriculum, which mm -hmm. appeared in Spectrum, what, in, in 80, 81, something like that, um, and, and, and see how important uh, he felt at that point um, counterpoint and figure based training were for a, re a real understanding of how music works. Um, you know, I'm old enough that, that when I first uh, studied music theory in high school, um, we were using materials out of piston at mm. the time. Uh, and by the way, jo John Rink. Uh, who, who's now in England, uh, John Rink was in my high school class and he and I were together in that, that music theory class. Um, wow, and, I, feel, and, I feel sorry for that and, theory teacher. I mean, that would have been... Oh, oh he, no, he was terrific. He was the choir director in our high school. His name was John Vanderslice and God bless him. Uh, he was just wonderful and patient with us. Um, and, 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 and we were working out of, you know, piston type material. And one of the goals in the class was to just simply write, you know, these four voice chorales. And, and I remember at a certain point, the teacher saying, oh, well, you really have this style down now. And, and, and I thought, I don't know what the style is. All I'm doing is following, you know, all of these rules. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's important for us, you know, to be thinking about, well, the practicality of you know, where, where is this stuff going? And I think contextuality is a huge change, even just in the last 20 years. Uh, of theory pedagogy, uh, every textbook that comes out now, uh, you don't get those little, you know, abstract four part things much anymore. You're always seeing pieces and how they work in various textures and so on. And I think that's such a good thing. It's one of the things that I even tried to do in oral skills is, you know, if you look at my anthology for sight singing, uh, everything's from real music you know, in there. Mm. Uh, and and um, the the recordings, you know, because of the the, the strictures of, of uh, perception and cognition and whatnot, we have to have an awful lot of sort of hot house things at the very beginning. But as the book goes on, there's more and more real contextual pieces uh, in there, and even in the listening stuff. And I think that 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 that's really important. So I think that that's changed. Um, something else I I think that's going to have a, a, a huge effect on, on the field is the advent of team-based learning and flipped classrooms. Uh, I think that's going to make a big difference in, in what we do. I know uh, Jason Hooper here at UMass uh, is probably uh, the first person to teach a true team-based uh, Theory One class. Uh, 
Uh, mm-hmm. But there are other schools now that are adopting things like that. And, and um, the flipped learning, um, that's huge. And I, I think COVID is actually uh, forcing that on a number of us now so that we're, you know, posting five minute segments of lectures rather than giving the same old lecture every year for 50 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. You say, well, how can I break this down into something that students can digest here and, and rewatch and re-listen? Um, and, and I think that's going to have a big, big effect on, on theory pedagogy. Can you talk to us a little bit more about, I'd be curious to know about the other things that have changed or say the same, but I'm curious to know about the team-based learning and how that's working in, uh, in your theory class. Oh, well, uh, you should probably talk to Jason Hooper about this, and I, he'd actually be a very interesting uh, interview on this. And he gave a, a lightning talk at SMT a couple years ago, ago about, about the topic. Um, but the, the idea is uh, what's been going on in STEM? Uh, you know, so in science, technology classes and whatnot, um, where um, rather than students just simply working on their own, uh, they do the reading, they come to class, they listen to a lecture. Um, instead, they form teams and they have to solve problems. And the notion there, I think in part, was at least that industry wanted this. They wanted people graduating from uh, college with the ability to work in, in teams. Um, and um, so Jason looked at this and looked at the, the, the results that they were getting in STEM and that it was really bringing up uh, an awful lot of students. Um, the, 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 you know, the results aren't, aren't f- amazing, but they're, they're promising. And, and um, what you see is that it does seem to bring up an, an awful lot of students from the lower end of grade scales towards the middle, bring some of the middle students up. You get some of the students towards the high end, the overachievers who don't necessarily like it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so what, what uh, they've been doing, the model is, is uh, the same thing they're doing in STEM, or as, as uh, Jason says, it's, it's like a sports bar. You've got all these circular tables around and screens on the wall and groups of people. Uh, and I think he has either groups of three or four. Uh, that he uses for this. And they'll work on, uh, so for example, at the beginning of our curriculum is, is rudiments for three weeks or so. And so they'll work on rudiments problems, on key signatures, on, on uh, clef reading, and on, on uh, intervals and so on. Uh, and they'll solve them together. Uh, and so what they do is that they will watch lectures uh, that, that um, are posted online, and they come into class, and then there will be a quiz and they answer things with clickers, and that checks everyone's um, uh, retention of what, or, or uh, comprehension of what they've, they've watched or read over, over the uh, period between the last class and this one. And as long as that seems good, uh, then they'll go ahead and work on uh, these particular kinds of problems together. Uh, and nonetheless, there are still quizzes that students have to do uh, individually and assignments that they have to submit individually to show their individual work and be able to be assessed and evaluated individually. But it's the team-based work where they seem to gain an awful lot of support from one another. Mm-hmm. And he even has these methods of uh, developing teams with students who seem to complement one another. So a treble clef reader and a bass clef reader mm-hmm. and a singer and an instrumentalist and a person from rural Massachusetts and someone from from Boston, you know, those kinds mm-hmm. of things. So, um, and and th- so th- there seems to be an awful lot of benefit from that. Um, and when they get into species counterpoint, then they're really solving some trickier problems. And so mm-hmm. the students will try to solve these in groups uh, rather than just come up with their you know own individual solutions for things. That's really cool. And that happens normally in a theory class like that. And that's kind of the one of the uh, unstated goals is that this this cohort develops and you have this kind of group that Mm-hmm. comes together and then they're together for the next number of years. But this is a very intentional way of doing that and really using that to the best benefit. I think that's great. Yeah, that's really great. Could you tell us about UMass Amherst? Just what is the makeup of your student population, your music majors, that kind of thing? What kind of students are you working with? Um, we uh, get students from all over New England uh, on the undergraduate level. We get students from all over New England um, and down into New Jersey uh, and Pennsylvania. And um, the population, I think, is somewhere in the high 200s uh, undergraduate students, maybe 280, something like that. And then we'll have maybe 50, 60 graduate students on, on top of that. Um, and we have a, a, a typical undergraduate theory curriculum of four semesters of oral skills, five semesters of theory, written theory. 
uh, and then the keyboard component that goes along with that as well. I'd say that uh, probably half of the students are music education majors. Um, then there's a, a very big swath of performance majors. Uh, and then beyond that, we actually just started a new Bachelor of Arts in um, Music Theory and a Bachelor of Arts in Music History. And that's really starting to attract some attention. I think we already have about, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 applicants mm -hmm. for that program. Uh, and it's interesting because it's students who don't want to perform. They want to study. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's something that we're trying out, and I'm, I'm very interested to see how that, that, that ends up. Um, like everywhere that I've taught and everywhere that I've visited as a consultant, uh, guest lecturer, um, students seem to divide themselves into three groups. Um, there's this very small group at the bottom, and you wonder what they're doing there, and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's part of what the college experience is about for some people. And then there's this big uh, group of people in the middle who are really just fine, and they're going to do fine. They're going to do fine in life, uh, and they may or may not do fine in music, but that's okay too. Uh, and then there's this group of, of students at the top who are really something special, and they distinguish themselves in a number of different ways. Um, you know, sometimes we get some of those who, who do undergraduate volunteer work as teaching assistants in the oral skills or the theory program. Uh, we've got one right now. She's just absolutely wonderful. Zoe Stinson is her name. Um, she's a saxophonist, and she's a brilliant performer, but she lives in breeze in, in oral skills and theory and so she's been very very helpful to us and you know it, it, it no matter where you go you seem to find students mm -hmm. in those those three groups of things mm -hmm. yeah i agree i've taught at the university of north texas which is of course very large and has a really outstanding and renowned music program and i teach now at a smaller liberal arts university in dallas dallas baptist and i've said all along we have the same kinds of students there's no difference um you know, we have a smaller program and a different feel to our program, but it's the quality of students isn't necessarily different. There are students at UNT who struggle a lot. There are students, yep. you know, at my school who, who end up thriving and going on to really excellent graduate programs. The students are the same everywhere. You're right. I'd say we have the same three categories and probably Paul and Ben would say the same thing. And, and I think that that goes all the way up to conservatories and it goes all the way back the centuries. Um, look, as far back as I looked into this, um, there's a little section in the preface to Oral Skills Acquisition where I uh, cite a report from Juilliard, the Juilliard School, and they're complaining about the students who show up without enough preparation and so yeah. on and so forth, and <laughs> blah, 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 right? We, and it's like our job to meet the students where they are and try to figure out how to get them the skills and knowledge that they need. I actually remember a, a, an SMT a while back where you were speaking about something and you pointed out, like, if we really look back to theory one and we look to the right and we look to the left, like, is it really that different <laughs> who was in the room with us versus now? Because we like to think that maybe our students are less prepared or, or less whatever, but we all have PhDs in this. So obviously... <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> this is a strong area for us. And uh, if we, if I really look back and I look to the right and the left, you know, I don't know that it's so different than the way it is now in terms of preparation. I, I think that uh, human nature will out. I think that there are always be good <laughs> students and bad students in a subject. And you know, mm -hmm. our job is to try to help them all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Well, time has really just flown by. <laughs> it, it does every time, but this is this has just been so great, and I I could ask a lot more questions, but we we promised that we'd we'd be about forty five minutes, and uh, and so we appreciate you taking your time um, during your sabbatical uh, to uh, to talk with us. We have just some short little. Um, uh, rapid fire questions that we like to ask. Um, I'm not sure if Jen or Ben are ready to go with theirs yet. These are questions uh, right, right off the cuff. Um, and so, Jen, do you have something? I think I have something. You go ahead. Okay. All right. So this is one that I've never asked, but I figured I'd ask you, Gary, since um, RL skills is your thing. Um, so I would like to ask, what's your one piece of advice for someone about to teach their first oral skills course. So this could be, you know, a theorist or maybe, you know, someone who has another uh, music degree, but, you know, they're going to be going to teach their first oral skills one class. What's the piece of advice that you're going to give them? 
Oh my gosh, one piece of advice. So, I wrote a whole book about this. Uh, <laughs> I want you to distill all okay. of your work to one thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I would say have standards, have standards, and know how to get students to meet those standards. And, mm-hmm. and if you don't know how to get students to meet those standards, you shouldn't be maintaining those standards. That's the most important mm-hmm. thing, I, I'd say. Um, and so figuring out how to get students to meet those standards is what theory pedagogy study is really all about. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And if you don't know, you have a workshop every three years that you can, yeah. you can learn, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, all right, I have one. So we've talked a lot about oral skills. So if we're thinking about written theory, what is one thing commonly taught in the written theory curriculum that you would say, toss it, we don't need it? Ooh, one thing. (laughs) Probably the uh, post-skip reversal. The idea that if you're writing something melodic, even in counterpoint, and if the music Mm. skips, that it has to change direction. Uh, If you look at what, uh, who was it, uh, uh, Brett Arden, uh, uh, Paul von Hippel. I'm trying to remember who the folks that were involved in this. I'm sorry uh, to, to you guys, but but I know that they, they uh, looked at this statistically, and it really only has to do with vocal range. Uh, it's a byproduct of the fact that, right, if you've got a high note already and you're skipping up, there aren't that many pitches up above there, so more often than not, the music's going to turn around. It really just has to do with accommodating singers' range ranges, mm. and it's not a characteristic of the music itself. As the uh, starting note gets lower, uh, more often you will see a skip up followed by something you know in the, in the upward direction. So I would just say that that's just one of those little obscure things. Uh, look, if we're talking counterpoint, how about nota cambiata? And, okay, if you want to try to be a palestrina, that's fine. But if you're really trying to teach counterpoint to help students understand how music works, um, I, I think you could just toss capiatas out as well. I think that's fair. <laughs> ben, you're up. All right, mine would be, uh, who is your favorite composer or artist to teach? Ooh, oh, that's a good one. Um, well, let's, okay, I'm going to fudge your question a little bit. I'm going to go between tonal music and, and post-tonal music. Um, okay. in, 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 in tonal music, it would be Beethoven. Um, he's just my favorite composer. As Morton Subotnick told me once, he's, he's an advertisement for Anison. Uh, in that if you look at the sketchbooks and you look at the way that he's working things out motivically, um, there's just these amazing things going on in pieces. Um, so motivic connections from the small to the large, motivic parallelisms, for example, uh, but also the working out of large scale tonal structures. I always has a, had a suspicion when I was uh, young that there were composers like Beethoven, Schubert, um, uh, where uh, they were taking you on a ride and you were in good hands. And you knew where that you could hear like what Schenker called the eye of the modulation, right? You, you could hear where the music was heading 60 measures in advance of things. And, and it was only through then studying Schenker that I came to understand how that works, why that has that kind of effect on us. When you graph something out, you can see there's this huge process uh, afoot. Bach does that stuff too. I just like Beethoven better. He speaks to my soul a little bit more. On the, on the atonal side, um, that's a tough one, but probably Bartok. I just think Bartok is wonderful. He was just working at all these these wonderful things. There's a reason that he was half of my dissertation, uh, just because I, I feel like he's a soulmate and pushing notes around. And I just love the stuff that he was experimenting with. That's yeah. great. That's great. So as we wrap up, um, Maybe we can finish up by letting us know kind of what you're working on or what you have kind of uh, coming down the pike. And um, if our listeners want to learn more about your work or your workshop and things, kind of how um, they can uh, connect with you. Okay, um, what I'm working on right now, um, I've done this thing in my career where I've always looked ahead to the next thing. It's like, ooh, what's the next exciting project? And so I had a bunch of papers that I'd given over the last couple decades uh, that I never followed up on publishing. So that's actually one of the things that I've been doing. So that MTO paper that I, I mentioned, for example, uh, on solmization and, and tonal perception, um, th- that was something that actually I gave m- more than 20 years ago. And so that that's finishing up now. Um, I'm I'm 
working with um, Cynthia Gonzalez and a few other folks from that special session that was held at SMT last fall, and we're uh, putting together a, a, a jointly r written article on um, uh, oral skills acquisition, and you know, mm -hmm. since the book appeared, and you know, what kind of uh, research has been done and what needs to be done in the, in the future. So those are sort of the two uh, projects that I'm working on there. Uh, and then on the textbook side, I've got a couple of things. I, 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 I'm not one of those people who likes to come out with a new edition of a book every few years. Uh, so there were a good 10 years between the first editions of my uh, manual for ear training and sight singing and the uh -huh. anthology uh, and the second edition. Um, but there are things that I want to do in, in third editions there for the manual uh, error detection. Uh, there are very, very few sources for error detection, and so I want to integrate. I thought about this two ways. One was to create a new textbook on error detection, uh, and another way is to just simply weave it into the manual, and I think that's what I'm going to do is just simply, you know, create hundreds of new recordings uh, and then have, you know, discrepancies between notation and, and, and the recordings and then very specific ways of gets, getting students uh, over the curriculum to get better and better at identifying error detection, because honestly, that's probably one of the most important things that comes out of oral training. Uh, and, and then on the anthology side, I'd actually like to do an awful lot f uh, for inclusivity in, in the literature. Um, you know, the, 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 all the uh, dead white men uh, that are in the anthology are terrific, but there's no reason why there couldn't be lots of literature, more literature uh, by women and by uh, composers of color and whatnot. And uh, I view that as an important uh, job in the, in the near future. And then there's one other thing that I'm working on, and that's a fundamentals text. Um, and I do have a book as a PDF right now. It's 17 chapters, and it's something that we use in a fundamentals class here, a uh, class for non-majors uh, at UMass. Mm. And I could just very easily, I think, turn that into a written uh, textbook. But what I'd like to do is make an interactive book. Uh, so something where uh, the, the, the book knows how well the student is doing and then progresses on the basis of uh, how they're achieving. And, and that's something that I need to work with a really good uh, programmer for. My, my son is a programmer, um, and, and um, he works for Etsy. Um, and oh, cool. and um, he's one of the systems engineers there. And uh, he could do this. But he's got a job, and and and, and, and so I, I'm not I'm not sure which way I go, but I, I would absolutely love to be working with them uh, that way. That's cool. So Commodore 64 um, programming, that kind of that training didn't 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 uh, age very well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you can even you know find an 8-bit machine that'll that'll work right now. <laughs> So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We'll be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.